This is the first video for chapter four. And in general, I've been trying to create one video per subsection of our text. But in this case, I'm actually going to create two videos out of the subsection of cyclic groups and their properties because there are two properties and each property has several corollaries. So for this first video, we're going to look at the property that a to the i is equal to a to the j. Before we dive into that property, let's just remind ourselves what is a cyclic group. So a group is considered cyclic if there's an element A in our group, such that if we take A to the n for all powers of n in the integers, that we are going to generate the entire set. So one way that we denoted that is that G, the group itself, is equal to the cyclic subgroup generated by A. So if we think about it, essentially we're saying a sub zero, a sub one, or sorry, a to the zero, a to the first, a to the second, a to the third. Now, this is for multiplicative notation, but recall if you have um, additive notation, that's going to be, say, negative three um, times sorry, negative three times whatever the generator is, negative two times the generator, negative one times the generator, zero times the generator, one, and so on. Sorry, I'm running out of room here. But just keep in mind, if it's additive, we're still going to be multiplying, and if it's multiplicative, we're going to be taking it to powers. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. We have um, the group of integers under addition. So keep in mind that the group of integers is an infinite set, and it's the only example I have for you that includes an infinite set. Now, often it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around the fact that this would be considered cyclic, but remember, we're not going off of this idea in our head about cyclic circling back to the beginning. We're saying this is our definition. Can I generate all of the integers using one, well, sure I can, because this is addition. So I'm thinking about all of the integers times n. So negative five times n, negative four times n, so on, so on, so on. Of course, that's going to give me every single value because I'm using every single integer times one. Same thing with negative one. I'm going to take each of those values times negative one. It's still going to give me every single integer. Uh, let's look at U14. U14 is the set of um, values less than 14, relatively prime to 14, under multiplication mod 14. So we have talked about this one in previous videos. The set, this is the set of values. And if I take 3 and write out 3 to the first, 3 squared, 3 to the third, which is 27, but mod 14 is 13, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, it is going to give me all of the values in this set and end up at 1. And z sub n, the whole numbers less than n and relatively prime to n under addition mod n. So for instance, if I said Z3, we'll make it an easy one. That would be 0, 1, and 2. So it's all of the values from 0 up to N minus 1. And this is addition mod N. Now, in this case, the generator is still going to be 1 and whatever N minus 1 is, but there also could be further generators. So um, we'll look at a couple later on in this video and throughout uh, your practice problems where you'll have z sub n that might have say four generators but in this case that would tell us that one is a generator and again this is addition so I'm adding one one plus one is two two plus one is three which is zero so that just generated the whole set and then n minus one would be two so this one gave us one two zero 2 gives us 2, and then 2 plus 2 is 4, but 4 is 1, and then 1 plus 2 is 3, which is 0. 
Uh, real quick, before I go over the non-example, if you're in my class and watching this video, when you give me a cyclic subgroup, I do wanna see it in the order in which it is um, generated. A lot of students wanna go straight for two and say, well, obviously, two gives us zero, one, and two, but it doesn't give it to us in that order. So when you do it in my classroom, I do wanna see the actual order so that I know that you're doing the work. A non-example would be U8. Again, similar to U14, there are four elements in the set, but if we look at the elements generated by one, we just get one, by three is three and one, by five is five and one, and seven is seven and one, and none of those generate every single element in the set. So U8 is not a cyclic group. So let's look at our property that we're going to focus on in this video. It says, let G be a group and let A be some element in that group. If A has an infinite order, so we're talking about the element itself having an infinite order. So we'll use the example of one in the integers, which is an infinite set and one has an infinite order because it's never going to get back um, to the identity. It's never gonna circle back around. The only time that one to the I is going to equal to one to the J and remember, even though we're writing it like this, if we're talking about this set of integers, we're really talking about n times one. So the only time, not n, we'll use i, i times one and j times one, when is that ever going to be true? Well, it's only going to be true when i is equal to j. So if I said that this was five times one and said, what's J have to be? You would say, well, obviously J has to be five in order for that to be true. Now this is true when A has infinite order. Now this should make sense to us because if we think about an infinite set, it's not going to look like this where we're going to circle all the way back around and continue and continue in a circular motion, like a lot of cyclic groups are. Those finite cyclic groups are going to have the same structure in general. So if I have a finite group, say a to the zero, a to the one, a to the two, a to the three, a to the four, and let's say this group has order five, well then a to the fifth is also going to be right back here. So we can see that this would be a to the sixth, and this would be a to the seventh, and this would be a to the eighth, and this would be a to the ninth, and we could continue forever. But again, this is a finite cyclic group, so it's going to continue to circle back around. So if we have a finite cyclic group and we have some element of order n, then we're going to generate some subset. So we're going to keep going back until we get to the identity because typically we'll write this over here. And a to the i is going to be equal to a to the j if and only if n divides i minus j. So there is a proof in your textbook. I'm not going to go through that proof with you. I'm more concerned that you understand what the theorem or property is telling us um, and you can look in the textbook for that proof. So let's take a look at an example using five, which is an element of Z20. So five's in here, as we can see. We wanna find some examples of I and J such that five to the I is equal to five to the J. Well, we're going to use this property that says, if that's true, then N has to divide I minus J. Well, what's N? Well, if I'm looking at five, that's telling me I have to find the cyclic subgroup generated by five. Well, that's five times one, five times two, five times three, five times four, which is 20, but zero mod 20, because that's what we're dealing with is mod 20. So the question is, what is the order of that element or that cyclic subgroup, the order is four because there are four elements in that set. So what are some examples of i and j such that five to the i is equal to five to the j? Well, according to this, we're saying that four must divide i minus j. So what are some examples? According to this, 
5 to the 0 should be equal to 5 to the 4 because 4 minus 0 is 4 and 4 divides 4, right? So if we said this is 4 and this is 0, that should work. Well, what about 5 to the 1st and 5 to the 5th? Should those be the same? Yes, because 5 minus 1 is 4. 5 squared is equal to 5 to the 7th. 5 to the 3rd is equal to 5 to the 8th. And we could continue this again forever in the same way that I can circle this around. We're saying 5 to the 0 is 0 and 5 to the 4th, this is 1, 2, 3, 5 to the 4th is 0. 5 to the 1st is 5. 5 to the 5th, remember this is 5 to the 4th, 5 to the 5th would be right back there. So that is one way that we can use this theorem. Let's take a look at three corollaries that um, belong to that same theorem. So I've rewritten the theorem at the top. The first corollary says, for any group element A, the order of A is equal to the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by A. Now, we really kind of talked about this without talking about it in our last example. Remember, we were looking for the order of five. Well, in order to find the order of five, remember we're saying, Okay, if I would used five, how many times would I use five to get back to the identity? So we said, well, that was five to the first, which was five. Two times five is 10, three times five is 15, four times five is 20, which was zero. And so that number was four. But the way that I found it is to find the cyclic subgroup generated by five, which was five, 10, 15, zero. And then I said, well, that value, whoops, that value was 4 and therefore the order of the element 5 is 4. So I did it on the last example without really um, talking about why I was doing it but that is why I'm able to do that. The next for any group element with the order of a is equal to n. So remember if the order of a is equal to n that means a to the n is equal to e. So if a to the k is also equal to e then n divides k. Well, this should make sense. If the order of a is equal to n, then n is the smallest value such that a to the n is equal to e. So a to whatever power is equal to e. So if a to the k is also equal to e, essentially we're saying that k is some multiple of n. So for instance, let's say um, the order of a was 3. Well, that tells me a to the third is equal to e. But it also tells me that a to the 6th would be equal to e, and a to the ninth would be equal to e, and so on. And that's all this is saying. It's saying if some value, say a to the 21st, is equal to e, then 3 has to divide 21, or 21 has to be a multiple of 3. So that's all it's saying, which seems pretty straightforward. Last one, if a and b belong to an, a finite group and are commutative, then the order of AB divides the order of A times the order of B. I wanted to do an application question for the second two corollaries that we just talked about. The first one's pretty straightforward, so I didn't really feel like that warranted an example that's specific to, I guess, one that we haven't talked about already. But for the second corollary, this one says that if A has an order um, of N, that a and a to the k is e, then n divides k. So here's an example question from your textbook that uses this specific corollary. So we said g is cyclic and a is an element of order n. So the order of a is equal to n. That also tells us that a to the n is equal to the identity. Suppose that a to the 24th is also equal to the identity. What are the possibilities for n? Well, using that corollary, we said the order of a is n, and if a to the k is e, so essentially we're saying k is 24, then n has to divide 24. So what are elements, or what are the values that divide 24? Any factors of 24? 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 12, and 24. So n could be any of those values. We don't know which one. We don't have enough information to know. We just know that it's one of those. 
Let's look at the last corollary. If A and B belong to a finite group and AB is equal to BA, then AB divides, the order of AB divides the order of A times the order of B. So I couldn't find a good question in your um, textbook from the list of questions at the end of chapter four. So I just sort of made one up to uh, help us to understand, I guess, the math here. So we're saying G is a finite cyclic group where AB is equal to BA. If the order of AB is 24, so I'm looking at this, 24, it has to divide the order of A times the order of B. So I'm just going to call, obviously the order of A is six, that's given to us. What are the possibilities for the order of B? So I'm just gonna call it B just for the sake of um, notation and not getting too many crazy lines in there. Essentially we're saying 24 has to divide six B. Well, what does it mean to divide? The definition of division says that there's some integer M such that this is going to be true. So let's go ahead and divide by six. 4m has to equal b. So what does that tell me about the order of b? Well, the order of b could be zero, which wouldn't really make sense, right? But the order of b could be four, because that would be m is one. It could be eight. It could be 12, it could be 16, and so on and so forth. So the possibilities for the order of B is basically multiples of four. Up next, we're going to look at the other main theorem in this section, which is that the cyclic subgroup generated by A to the K is the same as the cyclic subgroup generated by A to the greatest common divisor of N and K.